Thank you for joining us on Palestine Studies TV. I'm your host, Willie Omens. In this segment, we'll be speaking with Salim Tamari, Associate Professor of Sociology at Birzeit University. I'll be speaking with him about his book, Year of the Locust, A Soldier's Diary and the Erasure of Palestine's Ottoman Past. Thank you for being with us today, Professor Tamari. Thank you. Who are the three soldiers at the center of this book? There were two Arab uh, Jerusalem soldiers, mm -hmm. uh, Arif Shahade and uh, Turjman from Jerusalem. And there's a man called Mehmet Faqih from Mersin in uh, Anatolia. Uh, Faqih uh, fought in uh, the Gallipoli Front. He, he fought before that in Palestine, in, in Gaza. And he went later on to become a very prominent commander in the Turkish Republican Army. Uh, the Arif fellow became the well-known uh, historian, Arif al-Arif, but he spent most of the year in Siberia. He fought on the Russian front, was captured with all his uh, battalion uh, in a very bloody battle in Erzurum. Uh, which the Arabs called Abderu, mm -hmm. in the Caucasus, and was shipped to Siberia. He spent all the war in Siberia until the coming of the uh, Bolshevik Revolution, and then he escaped and went to Manchuria. From Manchuria, he came and joined the uh, Arab revolt. Mm -hmm. uh, and Turjman uh, was stationed briefly in the southern front near Suez, but managed through family connection to be reappointed in a clerical job in Jerusalem where he used to sleep at home and work for the Jerusalem garrison under the commander of a man called uh, Roshan Bek, an Albanian commander. And he wrote his memoirs uh, while he was uh, on the job uh, in the army. What was life like in Jerusalem during the war? Well, that's one of the most exciting aspects of the book, is that this man who is stuck in a city almost devoid from its men because young men were uh, conscripted and sent to the fronts in Gallipoli, in the Caucasus, some were sent to southern Iraq to fight in Kutl Amara, and the bulk probably fought in Suez, which is the southern front mm -hmm. at the time. He was stuck there in a city I wouldn't say ghost city, but a city devoid of men. Mm -hmm. And the misery of the war is reflected in day-to-day -day yearning for quietism, for basic foodstuffs. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of pages written about the absence of tobacco, for example, mm -hmm. which was a major hardship mm -hmm. for both the soldiers and the populace. And also the breakdown of the social order. You see prostitution in the streets, begging, uh, people taking liberties, uh, but also yearning for what will come after the war, yearning for a free, uh, peaceful time, and uh, uh, also reconstruction of identity. You can see that people are thinking now, where will we go from here? Uh, will we go with Syria under Prince Faisal, will be part of the Egyptian Confederation, or will we continue to be part of an Ottoman Empire that's reconstituted in a new way, which was heralded by the democratic constitution of 1908? What about this question of Palestine's Ottoman past? Can you get from soldiers' diaries as opposed to other memoirs or other documents from that time? Well, first, the fact that they are diaries is significant yeah. because they are written at the heat of the moment. Yeah. They express the language, the feeling, the intimacy, uh, and the existential fears of that moment. And that makes it very different from memoirs written by statesmen and uh, politicians and notables uh, in retrospect. In retrospect. Mm -hmm. and so uh, they do not reflect what we feel now about that period with the language of nationalism and the language of what happened later, but they tell us how people thought at that moment. The second feature of it is that it uh, 
it reflects the, in this case, the concerns of the common man. I mean, uh, here we have a very ordinary common soldiers talking about themselves. Mm -hmm. Unlike much of the diaries that we later inherited uh, from the Ottoman period. It's very unique actually to get a common soldier, because most people were illiterate, mm -hmm. to write about their feelings at that time. Mm -hmm. How did you get a hold of Turjman's memoirs? The Turjman diary actually is deposited in the Hebrew University and was pillaged by the uh, Israeli army when it was the Haganah before the state of Israel mm -hmm. was established from the domain of the Turjman family at Prophet Street. So it was part of what is now known as absentee property books and it is still there. And people, I, I paid uh, fees for having it copied. And uh, so I was the first person to actually uh, decipher it and publish it. I say decipher it because parts of it are written in code. Oh. And uh, we had to uh, deconstruct what he was trying to say in this coded uh, part of the diary. That's fascinating. What exactly did these codes contain? What kind of information? For a long time, I, I, was, I wasn't sure what was in the coded messages because I assumed they were politically subversive thoughts that he was afraid the authorities would seize and punish him. And then a friend of mine who's a poet, Zakaria Muhammad, succeeded in breaking the code. And we found out that were mostly uh, expressions of his lust for his teacher's wife. Oh. He, he was so secretly in love, uh, one way love. And the other part was he had a rather hostile attitude to his own father, which he was afraid to write in, in plain. So it was very mundane <laughs> but very interesting uh, expressions of this soldier. It's interesting to think of a soldier writing a memoir. They're not probably thinking about a distant reader sometime in the future. Um, or was there an indication otherwise? Was, is there an audience that he's writing In, in some diaries, like Sakakini, he addresses the reader. Mm -hmm. He knows that someday these mm -hmm. diaries will be seen by his family member, by others, although he did not show it to them. But he addresses the reader. In the case of this soldier, he expresses very intimate thoughts that he would be mortified to know that not only we have read them, but we have published them. Mm -hmm. So I want to take this opportunity to apologize to this dead soldier <laughs> for having exposed his thoughts, but I think the, the balance of the matter yeah. weighs much more in favor of publishing it because it's so valuable to understand how people felt mm -hmm. about their nation, about their country, about their city, about people around them, it's extremely valuable uh, material. Mm -hmm. And his political thoughts about what was happening has major surprises for us. One of which, for example, was he was writing about debates among uh, the staff and soldiers in the Jerusalem garrison uh, during the war. And uh, he was considering the options for the future of Palestine. And one of the options which he favored was unity with Egypt. Mm -hmm. He, he thought this was the most practical outcome of the war, is that Palestine would become part of an Egyptian uh, federation. Uh, although a majority by that time probably favored unity with Syria under Prince Faisal, but apparently there was a current of thought which favored unity with Egypt, which he expressed in that diary. Interesting. I'd like to probe you a bit on this question of the Ottoman past of Palestine. What's the significance of it? Partly because it takes us back to a period when it was pre-colonial, before the Zionist movement rose and succeeded in bringing the Balfour Declaration. Partly because it deconstructs the nationalist history that was written both by Turks and Arabs about their past, when their past was actually common past. And uh, they had one regime. And it was not a colonial regime in the sense that uh, people did not feel that they were a colony 
of Istanbul. They were provinces in an imperial domain, and that domain included all sorts of nationalities. So it's a very important way of rethinking our past. The second thing is because it actually throws light on what's happening today. Uh, today, the Palestine issue um, it has to be thought in terms of its regional dimensions. And one aspect of that regional dimension is the rise of Turkey and Turkey's rethinking of its own past and its relationship with the Asian uh, republics and of the Syrian uh, of the Syrian and Arab provinces, which were part of that. And of course, part of it is pragmatic because. Uh, Turkey having been denied uh, joining the European Union now is reorienting its vision mm -hmm. to the East. But it also creates a new momentum with the loss of uh, Egypt uh, as a major force in the Arab world. Uh, there's the rise of Turkey uh, as a, a leading power uh, which has been uh, not intervening perhaps but playing a role not only the Arab-Israeli conflict, but in um, addressing inter-Arab issues and uh, Arab regional issues. And this has immense possibilities for Palestine, given the uh, existing hegemony of uh, America and Europe on dictating what will happen uh, to Palestine and to the Middle East in general. In terms of Turkey's new influence in the region, Professor Tomate, is it something that a lot of Palestinians see with a little bit of anxiety, perhaps as residue from the Ottoman past, or is it welcome as providing maybe new opportunities? I think more of opportunities. The, the anti-Turkish attitudes, which uh, were very dominant until the 1960s, have been now uh, relegated to a distant past, partly because of cultural matters. There's a lot of tourism, economic exchanges in the area. Turkey is the only country now that Arabs or Middle East can go there without a visa. And the Turks come to the Middle East. So people have re-established bonds which have been broken by the war and the aftermath of the war. And second, there's the cultural influence of Turkey through soap operas, cinema, which actually has become a prime time a viewing object, not only during Ramadan, but uh, for the rest of the year. And this has created new, maybe mundane, but very influential cultural aspects about the ways people look at Turkey and the way also Turkey looks at the Arabs. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are other things, most important of which, of course, politically, the intervention of Turkey the Marmara case and solidarity with Palestine uh, and the emergence of a third Islamic alternative through uh, AKP and uh, Recep Erdogan's party which is seen as a, a model for the new Islam, if you like, in, for the Arab countries. Are you concerned that some will criticize this book as being nostalgic? Well, uh, yes, you could say that. There is an element of nostalgia in it, uh, which you can accuse me of. Uh, in the case of the diary, the soldier actually has very strong anti-Turkish mm -hmm. sentiments because he does not want to f f die in the front. He want, doesn't want to fight for the uh, emperor, for the sultan. So he's actually very... He's, he's praying for the defeat of his own uh, army. This is a Turjman or? It's Turjman, yeah. not the other soldiers, yeah. but Turjman, saying, may God hasten the defeat of this army so we can be free. So there's no nostalgia there. Yeah. But, but in the framing of the way people looked at their own region as part of a larger empire, there's an element of nostalgia, which I think is part of the way people saw themselves in that period. Well, this sounds like a very interesting book, Professor Tamadi. I want to thank you. Uh, for joining us on Palestine Studies TV, and I'm definitely going to encourage people to read this book. Thank you. And thank you for tuning in to Palestine Studies TV. We're able to offer this series thanks to generous support and donations from individuals such as yourself. 
We are one of the only English language web series dedicated fully to providing interviews, expert analysis on Palestine. If you would like to see this series continue and grow, please donate today. You can do so at the website www.palestine-studies.org. Thank you.